I do want to welcome everyone to the kickoff of our Tuesday gardening series. Um, this is kind of a new step for us of doing in-person and Zooming. Um, if there's one thing that we've learned, um, hopefully we've learned more than one thing uh, through the pandemic, we've been able to really expand our reach in terms of using Zoom, um, you know, typical talks. Um, if you need any chairs, we can grab some. There's two right up front if you're not scared of me. I won't, I won't call on you. Um, but, you know, on a typical talk, we might get, on a, on a great attendance talk, we might get 50 people in person. We were, we've been regularly having about 100 people signing up on Zoom. So this is a great way for the gardens to increase their reach to make it easier for people to participate. So um, we are going to continue doing that. Um, someone said they can't hear. Sometimes that can be a glitch on your side. So give it a chance to maybe log out and log right back in. That usually fixes it. Um, that's the you know solution for anything IT. You turn it off and turn it back on again. Um, but before we start, just a few things, uh, just a couple updates for everyone. Um, we will be having um, renewal letters. We'll start going out shortly uh, for our friends of, of Renolda Gardens. Um, this is an important thing. If you aren't a friend, um, we ask you to consider becoming one. It's, it does make up a, a huge portion of our operating budget for every year. So. Uh, you know, it's a great way to support a garden you love. Um, with that being said, we will also, if you're a friend of Renolda Gardens, one of the benefits is you can get early access to our sale. Um, you know, traditionally we used to have just a friend's pre-sale where everyone comes and shops in person. Um, COVID made us learn uh, some new ways. Uh, we're still trying to figure out when we may do a survey after the sale to find out, do you prefer to pre-order online or do you want to just show up? Um, but, and we'll be guided by what our friends want. Um, so with that being said, just a few dates to keep on your calendar. Next Tuesday, Jimmy Spees is going to come and talk about the Dahlia Society that's recently formed in Winston-Salem. Um, and again, all these talks will be in person and Zoom. So it's one of those things, if you can't make it that day, and we will be recording these um, and making them available. But It'll be a great opportunity to, to learn about dahlias, to learn about this new society. Um, and Jimmy does a great time, uh, a great job of doing these classes. Um, two other classes that will be coming up. We have a class on October 5th that is on ornamental grasses and it's Shannon Curry. She's with uh, Hoffman Nursery. It's a wholesale nursery in North Carolina, but they are one of the top notch grass growers in the country. Um, they're fantastic. Uh, I can't say enough good things about uh, John and Jill Hoffman. They're great supporters of the industry. They're great people. Um, and their shirt, uh, it's great because it says Hoffman Nursery. And on the back, it says, we grow great grass, which is great until you have a sheriff standing behind you in line. Um, that was an interesting experience. Uh, he kind of tapped me on his shoulder and smiled. But she'll give a great talk about grasses. We'll also have a talk on October 12th about sustainable practices in the gardens. And this will range from, you know, keeping your tools working to harvesting water, things like that. It'll, be, it'll cover a myriad of, of ways that you can be more sustainable in your garden. Um, and then the first workshop will be September 28th. So not that far, it'll be just right after our plant sale. We're gonna do a cement leaf casting class. So. Um, that's a fun little thing to do in the garden, um, and we'll be able to harvest some different leaves out of the garden. Um, we had a friend that did, you know, if you've ever seen the Colocasia Thailand giant that has the leaf that's the size of a person, he actually did a massive one of those. Um, it was just spectacular. We don't have those because that would cost a lot to get some of that for it. Um, but at least you'll learn how to do it at home. Um, so with that being said, just a few details about the plant sale. Um, the plant sale again will be sat Saturday, September 25th from eight to two in the morning. Uh, we are not requiring you to sign up. We do ask that when you come, if you can wear a mask and please socially distance. Um, you know, it's just, it's for everyone's safety. Um, then, but we will, if you are a friend and you pre-order, uh, you can pick those plants up on Friday before the sale from 10 to five. 
Um, we do ask that if you pre-order that all those all those get paid. It just speeds things up. We're trying to every year you try to look at what went well, what needs to be improved. If we can, you know, have it where we don't have to worry about oh I, I pre-ordered but I'm adding these things this way. Hopefully it'll be one of those things that streamlines the process. We have a question. Yeah, well, yeah, we you can come back as many times as you want on Saturday. Fill the car up, unload it, come back and get another load. Um, yeah, but the only thing, you know, this way we don't have to sit there and go, okay, the total from that one, let's add this in. It's we're trying to fit, we're trying to make it quicker to check out, um, including adding another credit card machine. So we'll have two credit card machines, um, which you know that should help things. So so the so pre-order you will get if you are a friend of Renolda Gardens it goes out at two the an email will go out at two o'clock this afternoon so and then we will send out subsequent emails so we're going to do it as many times as we can to make sure that you know no one misses it um, but you can pre-order the cutoff date for that will be Wednesday before the plant sale at eight o'clock, because we're gonna to need to you know, wrap that up, get all the orders pulled and then get ready. The actual plant sale will be Saturday the 25th from eight to two. So we're excited about this. I think we've got some really good plants. Uh, uh, obviously I'm not talking about all the plants because we'd be here forever, but trying to highlight some of the fun ones. Um, so I think that's everything that we've got going. Um, I am recording, so that's good. So let me see if we can share this properly. Okay, I think, let me, let me see if anyone can uh, indicate that it's showing up on the Zoom correctly. Can I get a thumbs up? Can you see the, all right, hot dog, it worked. Um, so this is, you know, my rundown of a number of things in the plant sale. Um, if you can, uh, if you've got questions, just put them in the chat and I'll try to, I may not catch them right as they show up. Um, that's the juggling act that's difficult with Zoom, but I'll try to come back and answer any questions. Um, as I said, uh, you know, you can pre-order up to the Wednesday before the sale up till eight o'clock. Once we get your order, we'll tell, you know, make sure we've got everything available, send you a total and then send you a link. And then, uh, you know, you can pick it up that Friday um, from 10 to five, and you can also pick it up the day of the sale. But we do ask that all the pre-orders, that's already paid. We don't have to worry about that. It's just pick it up and go. Um, but that email will go out at two o'clock. So when you, when the folks that are here, when you go home, go check your email at two o'clock and, you know, if you don't get anything, email us and let us know because maybe you've lapsed um, and we'll get that remedied as quick as possible. So without further ado, buckle up. Um, this is a, a wonderful little sign at a, a friend's nursery out in Portland, Oregon. Um, had to get a photo of that because this is not a criticism. This is a term of endearment. Um, so I tried to group this uh, going through, you know, breaking it down between perennials and everything. So um, one of the first ones, this is actually, you know, I've kind of tweaked the sale. It has a heavy focus on natives, but if you've gotten to know me, I like all plants. As long as you're a good neighbor and well-behaved, you're welcome in the garden. But this plant sale will always have a focus on natives, but also throw in some cool stuff too. Um, and this one is kind of straddling the road. It's a hybrid between a, one of our natives and then an Asian species. But if you're looking for something to attract pollinators, Agastache, this whole group, they go bonkers over it. Hummingbirds love them. Um, this is an old one. It's been out, you know, as you can see, it was a great plant pick back in 2004. It's still on the market. It's got staying power. Um, this is actually a photo of our plants that we have, you know, waiting to go in the plant sale. Just hey, John, Sorry to interrupt, but the slides are not changing. What's that? The slides are not moving. Let's see. So is it still the introductory slide? Yes. Yeah, behind That's the weird. curtain. Oh. 
Okay. Does that show the Agastache? Yes. Okay. I think we might have it. Um, we'll advance for the next slide, but like I said, this is a hybrid, great for pollinators um, and it'll flower, long flowering time. It does, it really loves sun. Okay. Okay. How's everyone online? If someone, Barbara Rapp, if you can, is that the climbing aster? Yes. Okay, I, I think we got a joys of technology. So this is a plant that you don't see often. Um, it's a climbing aster. It's basically a woody vine. Um, it's fantastic. It doesn't start blooming until October. So it's great for any of your pollinators to get that last end of the season uh, nectar source. Um, and it'll flower. I've had flowers on this in December. We haven't had a really hard killing frost. I had one right up against a brick wall and it continued flowering. Um, but it's a vining aster. And I've seen this used either going up on a trellis or I've seen it let it scramble through other things. Um, but it's a fantastic plant that just doesn't get used enough. I would love for someone to breed this and get some different colors, but you know, this one is, is a fantastic thing. Yeah. No, it doesn't have the little tendrils that attach. So it would need a structure to kind of weave its way through it. Um, so, but you don't have to worry about it, you know, suffering right onto the side of your house or anything like that. Um, this is a plant that Lord knows it wouldn't even need to flower for me to include it in the garden. Uh, Amsonia hubrichii, um, 2011 perennial plant of the year. Um, anytime you see some of these things with the awards, that's always a good sign. Amsonia, you know, it's native further. It isn't necessarily, necessarily native in North Carolina, but it's in the area. Um, but it is fantastic. This was one of the plants I learned way back in my perennials class in, in, in college that we look more at the fall color on it. Um, it's wonderful. You can see in that upper picture, it gets these sky blue flowers. Um, it, you know, wonderful blue flowers in spring. Then you've got this wonderful lacy texture throughout the whole summer. And then fall, it just erupts into this beautiful yellow to gold. Um, we had a friend that actually cut stems of this, did it in a flower arrangement with one of the kind of black burgundy dahlias. It was just stunning. Um, but one of the things I used to use this when I was at High Point University, you know, I always got, oh, we can't see the bulb foliage when it's going down. Well, I planted a bunch of this right over all of our daffodils and everything. So daffodils are done flowering. This comes up, hides the foliage. It's no, you know, it's a great way to hide that stuff. But it's a fantastic plant. It's durable. Um, and just phenomenal fall color. Um, basically every plant sale from here to eternity, we will have butterfly weed in it because we all know the plight of making sure we've got that available for monarchs. Um, it is a, a plant that definitely pick where you want it because it does not transplant well. Um, you know, it's necessary because the caterpillars eat it, they actually get the sap and that's what turns into a poison. So it makes them in, not tasty to their predators. Um, but the flowers are a great nectar source for a whole host of pollinators. But, you know, butterfly weed, it's, it's just, you know, the only thing I would say is make sure where you plant it, you're not going to move it. Um, but it's a fantastic plant. Um, this is a new Coreopsis. Yes. No, it'll only get at max probably about 18 inches uh, tall um, by about 18 inches wide each individual plant. No, no, um, you know, as far as I know, I will never promote a invasive plant, um, who knows. Um, but Coreopsis, I think we're all familiar with, this is a species that I'm not that familiar with, so I'm really looking forward to trying this. Um, the name Fubescens refers to the leaves that actually has kind of hairs on it, which that's usually a good indicator of something that, you know, Piercing sucking insects like aphids and spider mites, they don't like, they want, you know, easy access to that leaf. So anything that has kind of hairs on it, they tend to not go for. So, um, you know, and this is not a tall blooming or, you know, tall, real tall Coreopsis. So it's only getting 18 inches tall. Um, you know, blooms midsummer to October, but, you know, just a, a different Coreopsis to add into the mix. 
Um, and it does well, you know, deadheading, cut it back a little bit and it'll reflower. Um, yes. I don't, not that I'm aware of. Um, that's th That last species is a bit new to me, so I'm looking forward to trying it. Um, coneflower, um, I think, you know, we'll, there are so many coneflowers out there. Let's just, you know, we're sticking with the straight species. Uh, it's great to leave the flower heads up after the seeds are up. The, the goldfinch will love you for it. Um, you also might get some seedlings that pop in around in your garden, so you get more. Um, it's, the, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, but it's a fantastic plant. Um, it's durable in our area. Some of the species are more prairie species that don't like garden settings. Um, but the typical purple coneflower will do just fine. You know, blooms basically throughout the summer. Should be winding down about now. Yes. Yes, full sun. So I actually, um, I actually made the effort and pulled. We're talking all about uh, perennials that'll go in sun right now. You can push some of these into shade. The whole thing is typically the less light, the less flowering, and it might get a little bit, bit more open looking. Um, this is a fun plant, Rattlesnake Master. Um, it got that name because it was actually used to treat rattlesnake bites. Um, but the other part of the, that yucca folium in its name refers to leaves like a yucca. Um, and if you look in the bottom photo at, the, at those leaves, it does kind of have a yucca-like look. They almost have a chalk blue color to them. And then when they start flowering, it sends this stem almost four feet up. And if you look at those flowers, they're just, you know, they look like little satellites or like a little solar system. But uh, this flower was taken over at my wife's garden in Kernersville. When this is in flower, it, I mean, this is an entomologist's dream because there are so many, you know, different wasps, moths, everything all over it, just going crazy. It's, it's a pollinator magnet. And it's so cool in terms of just a different texture in the garden to have these. And they'll seed around, which, you know, it's a good thing to have these, you know, basically building upon themselves. But they'll, it's a great thing to plant in amongst other things and then have it rise up when it comes to flowering. Mm -hmm. um, when, I, when I took plant ID way back when in college, there was a term for these. They were DYCs. They were damn yellow composites because... Mm -hmm. You know, as you drive around, you see everything yellow and trying to key these things out is not the easiest task in the world. This is a type of sunflower, Heliopsis. There's some really new varieties that have come out that um, almost burgundy red colors to them. Um, this happens to be an older selection. Um, one of the things is that this is, it likes it lean and mean. Don't throw fertilizer on this. It'll basically ruin the plant. Um, it likes you know, low nutrition, um, it can tolerate more dry conditions, but it's just a great native sunflower to add into the garden. Um, typically, you know, only get, getting about four feet tall at the best. Um, hibiscus coccinius, we do have the white flowered one in the plant sale this year. This was a big thing. I remember being back at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum and we had our plant auction and we get all these cool things in to auction off. We got two plants of the white flowered hibiscus coccinius from the U.S. Botanic Garden. We quickly said, these are not going in the plant sale because that was the first that this thing came on, on the scene, but it's easy to propagate. Um, it is a beast, so it will get about seven feet tall, um, but it's something that once you get planted, it can tolerate you know, average soil conditions. It can go into wet conditions. Um, the only thing is just make sure your DEA is informed of what it is because there actually have been stories about DEA raiding people's houses thinking that the, it was pot because the leaves look like pot leaves. Not that I know what that looks like. Uh, <laughs> but it is, it is, it's a hummingbird favorite. Pollinators love it. Um, it is, it makes a statement in the garden. So like the plants that we have up in the garden, they're, they're seven feet tall and about seven feet wide. So make sure you've got the room in the garden for these. Yes, they will die back to the end of the end of the winter. Yeah, we cut ours back. Yeah, we take it down to about you know maybe four or five inches from the crown because it'll reemerge from from the ground. Yes. They, if it's the only one, I'd feel more confident. If there's a, a red one there, you might get pink, who knows? Um, 
but you can get a nice mix of these. Um, this is another really cool hibiscus. I learned about this uh, way back when I worked for Tony Avent. It's hibiscus stays a calyx. Um, this comes from a region down in Texas and it's actually become endangered and it's become endangered because it's promiscuous. It keeps outcrossing to other species. So the actual species is being lost because it's just becoming hybrids. Um, what's cool about this, you get these nice little white flowers, typical hibiscus flower. What I love is if you look at the leaves down below, there, it's these fine textured leaves. And one thing that, you know, no one's ever done a true study. It's just surmising that it doesn't get chewed on by other insects because, and someone has said that sometimes dissected leaf plants, an insect sees that and is like, oh, someone else chewed on this. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's got this nice fine textured leaf and I've actually seen some decent fall color on these. Even the stems will kind of get a rosy red color. Um, so it's something that we leave up a little long, but yellow fall color on the leaves. Yes. Size, it'll get about four feet tall, uh, four to five feet tall, not as big as the, the coccinius. Uh, this is a rescue out of the garden. When we did, when we redid the planting beds around the lion's head fountain, um, about 75% of the plants that were around the lion's head fountain was just the Japanese water iris. So we dug all those clumps up, divided them. Um, it's a fantastic iris. Um, it's one of the tail end of the iris season. This one is Henry's white, pure white flowers. Um, it's great to put into wet areas if you have them in the landscape and it'll do equally, equally well in your average soil. Just don't put it in a dry soil. But you know, in a sense, you can have a little bit of granola. Um, but yeah, I, I, I couldn't bear to just throw these on the compost heap. It's, it's too good a plant. So we've got that one in the plant sale. If you are looking for a native iris, we do have iris virginica, which is Southern blue flag. Um, you might hear of yellow flag iris. That is actually an invasive iris. Do not buy it. Um, you know, it will seed around and it's gotten out into the environment. But the Southern blue flag is one of our natives. It can go into as deep as six inches deep of water. Um, I used this back when I was at the uh, pre at my previous job. We put it on the edges of retention ponds so it would fill in. Um, but it's a great, you know, light blue. There's some different colors. It'll seed around a little bit, which is great. Um, but it's a great, you know, native iris for the landscape. Um, you know, if any of you remember from last year, I went crazy on blazing stars. I had a whole bunch of different species of Leatris. Um, I calmed down a little bit this year. We just have one. Um, this is actually, it's dwarf blazing star. So it's only gonna get about 18 inches tall, um, but it starts coming into bloom right now and it'll flower pretty much up through frost. It's more delicate foliage to it. It's a fantastic, it's a butterfly magnet. And what's great, you know, if like with, with Leatris, if you get a couple different varieties, you can kind of stagger that bloom throughout the growing season. So you get one that blooms in June one that comes into bloom in July. Um, and this one kind of wraps up the season. Um, it's a fantastic plant. I had this at the butterfly garden at the previous job. Um, I'm really excited because I just found out there's a white version of it. Um, I'm trying to get that because, you know, I've got to have them all. Um, but, you know, this is definitely something worth having in the garden. Um, this is something that we, uh, when we had to, the crosswalk that went in up the road, uh, we had to move some of the plants of Lycoris, and I was like, let's pot some of these up, because every year everyone's asking about these. Well, kind of makes sense to offer them. Um, this is not a native, but it is a phenomenal plant to have in the garden. Um, Lycoris goes by a couple different names. I've got it listed as spider flower. Some people call it surprise lily. Some people call it naked ladies. Um, it's got that moniker because it flowers without the leaves. So it just sends up the flower spikes, the flowers get done, and then later on the leaves come up, which actually is a fantastic thing in the garden. So what I like to do is plant this amongst other things. So say you had some hostas, because these, you know, if you look on the, uh, out on our landscape, they're in shade. If you planted these amongst your hostas, what's great, your hostas go dormant instead of having a bare open area. End of the season, you get these red flowers, Everything goes dormant, and then the leaves of the of the Lycoris come up. Yes. Yes. 
Um, now the trick, there's an old wives tale about when you plant these that, oh, it takes seven years to, for them to flower. What that is, is you've planted them too deep. So when you get the bulb and the bulbs, you know, maybe like three inches tall, have the top of that bulb almost sticking out of the ground. So the seven years is if you plant it too deep, it's spending time making new bulbs above itself. So it, it'll actually say, okay, I'm too deep. Everyone else go above me. And that's why it takes so long for them to reflower. But these get planted shallow. But it is fantastic because, you know, everything else is dormant. You've got green leaves. They kind of resemble, I would say, liriope of, you know, that type of, of leaves, monkey grass. But it's an evergreen throughout the winter. Um, I just, I, that's how I've used it in the garden. Um, we've got a couple different flocks. Um, these are all cultivars, but you know, it's one of those things that sometimes you hear people going, oh, I just want straight species. Mount Cuba, which uh, is one of the preeminent centers for native plants, they, they do these phenomenal trials. Go on their websites and look up, you know, they put their research online. They did a study of all different flocks. There was a cultivar on there that attracted pollinators 10 to one over the species. So it's one of those things that, you know, nothing is ever black and white, um, you know, so if, you're, if your goal is to get pollinators, go with that cultivar. If you, know, if you want you know, as natural as possible and aren't as concerned about pollinator density or things like that, you can do stray species. But one of the nice things is these selected species, they're breeding to make sure they don't get powdery mildew, which you know, if you get that in the garden, it's horrible looking. You have to cut it down to the ground to get it to reflush. This, these with the fashionably, fashionably early series actually bloom almost a month earlier than the other tall flops. So it's one of those things of you can get different selections, extend your bloom season. Um, but these two, my wife kept raving about the ones in her garden. So we've added them here. These, when we redo the pink and white garden, these are some of the selections we'll use. So you've got flamingo and crystal um, and those will get about, and they aren't as tall as some of the tall garden flocks. So these will top out only at about three feet tall. Now we've got this other variety, opalescence. That's a nice pink one. And it, out of all the breeding that Walters Gardens has done, this has been the best one for powdery mildew resistance. Um, so, you know, you get the flowers, but you know, it's kind of detracting if your leaves are covered in gray with mildew. Um, so this one has been fantastic for disease resistance. Um, great flower color, um, but this one will be taller than the fashionably early series. So if you're trying to get some staggered heights in the garden, um, another reason to try some different ones. Yes. Flocks, I would put them on about a two foot spacing at least. Um, some of these new ones, like definitely the fashionably early series, one of the species they use to create that is a bit more of a creeper than a clumper. So it will gradually start moving, you know, in other areas, not aggressively where, you know, like something like Japanese anemone, but it will start, you know, widening its, its place in the garden. Yeah, I mean, that's one way to reduce powdery mildew in the garden is to have good airflow through your garden. So if it's just thick as can be, it's going to hold moisture, it's going to hold that humidity, which is a perfect environment for powdery mildew. Um, so this one, boy, you know, this decision was just validated last night. I have been late to the game on looking at mountain mints. Um, we went last year up to uh, Downton Park and seeing this in the landscape where, it, you know, it is a mint, so it will spread, but it's just wonderful how it blends and you'll see kind of little islands of it amongst other things. And any pycnanthemum species is an absolute pollinator magnet. I see everything going crazy over it. They get these nice, you know, kind of silvery bracts underneath the flowers. So if you look over on the, uh, uh, that pycnanthemum muticum, the mountain mint, those are bracts that are really making it stand out. Um, so I just, you know, they had three different ones offered from where we were getting our plants. So I was like, let's try all three. So, uh, you know, the one on the far, right of your stream, tenuifolium, it's got really narrow foliage. Um, so it's a bit more lacy leaf, doesn't have the bracts to stand out as much. But one thing, this was, uh, Brent Heath shared this little trick with me. He would grab the leaves off the mountain mint, crush them in his hand and then rub them on his arms. And he found out that mosquitoes stay away. 
So, you know, and it's fantastic. And my my decision to add a couple of different mountain mints was just validated last night because Mountain Cuba had a post on their Facebook page last night. The next trial they are doing is mountain mint. So they're going to try every different species to try to sort out, you know, what are the best ones. Um, there is one out there called Stowe Cascade. We have one plant. We need to propagate it. That clumps. It doesn't run. But these are just fantastic for pollinators. Um, I, you know, my whole thing, usually when I hear mint, I run the other way. Um, but this is something good. I mean, obviously, you have a small garden. You need to be mindful of that. Hide because mints tend to run like at marathon, at, at sprint pace. So mints will start creeping. So, you know, if you've got a small garden, it might not be the best to, you know, unless you want a big patch of it. So invasive, invasive is kind of a, I, I shy away from using that word. It's for, it can be formidable sometimes. You know, some of the mints, like I'd only put in a container, but these, you know, um, I, you know, I feel comfortable with having in the garden. It's just, you might have to rein them in occasionally. Most of the mountain mints will top off at about 24 inches. Um, now this is another spreading plant. This is Meadow Beauty. I learned this plant way back when I took a wetland flora class. It will flower for the majority of the summer right up till frost. Um, it's a, it, like I said, it will spread, so be mindful of that, but this can tolerate wet soils to average garden soils. It gets these wonderful, you know, purple flowers, and it's, it's actually related, if you've ever grown Tibicina or Princess flower, it's in that same family, and when you look at it, it's almost like you took a Tibicina and, and shrunk it down, um, but you'll see this if you go on the eastern part of the state, it'll be growing in ditches. Um, I love how the seed heads look like little urns. Um, they can actually get a little bit of fall color to it, but it's a fantastic plant for late season fall, you know, flowering. So starting midsummer right up till frost. And it is something that if it starts lo looking a little ratty or something, just hack it back and let it reflush. Okay, I'm gonna probably need to pick up speed. Um, this is a really cool sedge. Um, it's called white white top star grass. What's nice is, you know, it honestly, when it's not in flower, it just looks like a, a tuft of grass. But then, you know, about midsummer, you know, actually early summer, it'll send up these spikes to about 24, 30 inches tall. And the flower heads have these white bracts underneath each. And it persists. This these photos were just taken now. So this has been in flower for almost the entire summer. And I, I say flower with quotes around it because it's actually the bracts that are giving the color. Um, one thing I want to try is to cut some of these and use them as a cut flower to throw them in an arrangement. But it's just a it's a really cool native. Um, it tolerates wet sites to average soil sites. Just don't put it in, in a really dry site. Um, again, it is a sedge, so it will gradually creep out. So be mindful of that, but it's not aggressive. Um, but I. I don't know if this is becoming available. I found some plants and then we just quickly divided the daylights out of them. Um, this is another uh, kind of wetland plant, but it does well in garden soils. This is actually regarded, at one point it was endangered. They're still kind of debating about this. It's a rose gentian. Um, again, flowering, flowers in midsummer gets these wonderful pink flowers. Um, it can actually, it'll actually spread a little bit by runners. Um, but I've seen big patch of the, patches of these out in the wild and they're absolutely stunning. Um, and when we were able to get a couple of plants, you know, we've planted some in the garden. We actually want to share these. Um, it just was a, it was a no brainer to include this in the plant sale. Um, it's just not something you're going to find in most garden centers. Um, your goldenrods, quickly dispel the myth. It's not goldenrod that gives you hay fever. That's ragweed that blooms at the same time. Um, now, this is one that was selected way back in 93, and it has stood the test of time. It's a fantastic clone. Um, it does get bigger. It's a, it's a clumper. It doesn't run like some of the goldenrods. It will, the clump will get bigger with age, so be mindful of that. We have it out in the uh, blue and yellow garden. Um, it really makes a makes its presence this time of year um it's you know i mean you it almost looks like you could sit on it it's that sturdy but it's a fantastic selection um chicago botanic garden did a whole 
you know, plant trial on all different types of golden rods, and this one came out as number one. Um, and I mean, you know, it stood the test of time over the years. Um, we added another one that uh, this came out of Mount Cuba, Dr. Dick Lighty. Um, you know, anytime the native plant, you know, the head of the native plant garden selects a plant, you got, you know, it's got to be good. Um, but this is another clump forming solidago, a little bit of a different form on it than the um, fireworks, but this way, you know, a little bit of, of diversity in your garden, fantastic pollinator plant. Um, it's great, especially at, at this time of year to make sure you've got plenty of flowers in the gardens because some of these insects need to ramp up those energy reserves to get through the end of the season. And then Stokesia or Stokes Aster, um, this is native a little further south, but this has been, you know, improved upon over the years. So there's some great selections. It is an evergreen perennial. So, you know, it will be, give you a little evergreen tuft in the garden throughout the winter. Um, I always, I can't stand gardens that completely disappear, but you'll get flowers throughout the summer, this wonderful kind of royal blue. Um, there are white selections, but we're just selling the straight species. So expect this color. Um, it is good. You can deadhead them and get them to reflower a bit, or you can leave the flowers for birds and everything to go after the seeds. So moving on a couple, uh, one grass that I'm gonna talk about, for those of you who have grown Muhlenbergia or the pink muley grass, you see it on the highways, um, everyone loves it and it comes into bloom and everyone wants to buy it at this time of year, which is the wrong time of year to plant it. Um, it needs to get established before it goes into winter. And also it can be a little bit, you know, on the edge of if it's too wet, it'll die. Plant it too late in the season, it'll die. This is one that's actually native to Texas and Oklahoma. I first saw this at, Chica at, at Colorado, wait, Denver Botanical Gardens. It's almost zone five hardy. So it gives you that same wonderful airy appearance in the fall, but it's a bit more, you know, it's a tougher plant. It is shorter in stature than the, than the pink muley that we're used to. So, you know, when you're thinking about pink muhlenbergia, probably about three feet, almost pushing four feet in height. This one, you're looking at more like two and a half feet. But this is one that I planted a whole bunch of this at my last job and then I left to come here. Um, small price to pay, but um, I'm really excited to have this one in the, in the plant uh, sale. I'm hoping to add some to our garden, but it's a great, you know, late fall color fantastic fine texture for the garden. Okay, a handful of shade perennials. Of course, we've got some ferns. We have lady fern, um, you know, and generally speaking, most ferns are deer resistant. Um, I will never say they are 100% because a deer will eat anything, um, but this might be lower down on the list. So this is our lady fern. Um, it does, it can tolerate, uh, you know, sunny sites if there's a lot of moisture. Um, you know, that's usually the trick with ferns. If you move them into sun, you need to amp up the moisture. If you move them into shade, they can tolerate it a little drier. Um, but so this is lady fern. Now this is a selection of lady fern called lady in red, where that midrib that goes down it is actually red. So it just adds another dimension to uh, the ferns. But again, it does slowly spread. It's not one of the ferns that, you know, some ferns you want to take over a big space, some Times you want it a little bit more control. Um, we actually have a, a number of different other ferns. We've got ostrich fern, we've got Christmas fern, sensitive fern, um, two or three other different types of ferns, but they're kind of hard to depict on a PowerPoint. Um, this is our native, we will have our native Pachysandra for sale. Um, if you look in the, in the slide, at the bottom is the Japanese Pachysandra, which can be really aggressive. And it's kind of like, I wish our native had a little bit more aggression in it. Um, it does spread slowly, but what's fantastic about the native Pachysandra, this, the, the foliage will actually kind of take on a bronzing color in the winter, and then you'll get some, kind of some silver spotting that shows up. So it's absolutely stunning as a ground cover in the winter. Um, so this is our native, it will get white, white flowers in the spring, um, but we're happy to start including this um, you know, I personally would not recommend uh, planting Japanese Pachysandra. Um, one caution, and I don't know if this also applies to the native, Pachysandra is in the same family as boxwood. It is actually a host for boxwood blight. 
So, you know, if you have boxwood, maybe put this somewhere else in the garden. Um, but it's a fantastic plant. I'm always jealous of gardeners that have big patches of this in the garden. Um, this is a weird plant I learned when I worked at the Ralston Arboretum. Um, Xanthorhiza simplicifolia. It's yellow root. If you walk the trails, when you get to the wildflower area, there's some patches of it down by the creek. And that, when you see it in its native habitat, it likes to grow along creeks, along swamps, kind of in wet soils. Uh, it gives you this nice cut leaf foliage. Um, it's kind of nondescript, but it'll fill in in a shady area, especially if you've got a wetter site. It does, if it's out in the sun, it tends to get better fall color. So this, this photo with that yellow fall color, that's obviously going to be in more sun. Um, but it's really cool because when you take it out of the pot and you see the roots, the roots are bright yellow. Um, and they actually can use it for dye making. But it's just, a, it's a cool plant. Um, I always like seeing it in people's gardens because it's, it's definitely not something you would, you probably won't even find it in most garden centers. But it's a great native, kind of fills in, kind of a woody perennial ground cover. Um, think of it that way. Huh? The, the flowers are kind of cool. They kind of hang down. Um, I mean, it's nothing that you're going to be like, ooh, look at that beautiful drift of yellow root and bloom, but um, you definitely want to go up and inspect it a bit. So we do have um, the one vine we have in the sale, um, our native honeysuckle, coral honeysuckle. It is evergreen. Um, it is a favorite of hummingbirds. So this is definitely something if you want to you know, cover a fence, um, I think we just have the straight species. There's some selections out there like uh, Major Wheeler is a really great selection for heavy flowering. Um, but this is one that I'd, I'd recommend. If you like hummingbirds, this is great because it starts blooming right as they're migrating up. Um, so quickly going into shrubs. Um, this is a plant that I will tell you right now, it looks horrible in a container. When you see it, it's gonna look like someone took two sticks and put it in a container. Um, I describe it, it's kind of like a teenager. It's a bit awkward in its youth, but it's, it's a great investment of get it in the garden. It'll gradually throw some more suckers. It will spread. It is kind of a suckering shrub, not aggressively. Um, we had this plant in our last house and I remember a, a, a neighbor goes, oh, is that butterfly bush? Because honest to God, I stopped counting at 50 butterflies on it. It'll come into flower. It's got these wonderful white spikes of flowers and the swallow tails will go absolutely berserk over. Um, and it'll get great fall color, good yellow fall color. It just, the reason it doesn't sell that well is it does not look good in a three gallon. Um, oh, wow. it's like, yeah. Take me at my word. It's worth you know, taking a, a gamble on it. You won't be disappointed. Um, I've seen it go into shade and do well. Uh, dense, dense shade, I have not seen it do as well in terms of flowering. Um, but I've, oh my God, the Morris Arboretum has this huge mass that just goes down a slope. That's probably, I don't know how old it is, but it's massive. Um, it's absolutely stunning. I've seen, I mean, old clumps, and you can cut it back if it starts getting too tall, just hack it back. But I've seen old clumps that weren't touched that were probably 12 feet tall. Um, you know, but these are in big open arboreta that can just, you can go crazy with it. Um, this is a plant that I don't know why I didn't like zone in on it earlier in my career, but red chokeberry, um, it's a great multi-seasonal plant because you get white flowers in the spring, kind of resembling almost like spirea. You get unreal fall color and then you get persistent red fruit. So you get that, you know, that winter aspect. And then plus it's a great food source for songbirds. Um, it'll tend to sucker it, you know, and you, if you see it in the native habitat, it's great. It's a, usually along bogs or a, on swampy areas, um, but it'll do fine in regular garden soil. Um, but it's just a fantastic plant in the garden. I don't know why we don't use it enough. Yes. You can push it. It's one of those things that in full sun, it's gonna flower heavier and fruit heavier. As you go into shade, it'll, that'll start to diminish and it'll be a bit more open, um, but it's well worth that trade off, I think. It should do fine. Um, but with the oak tree, you know, 
See if you can get some supplemental water to it. It'll be a lot happier because the oak tree will suck that water right out. Um, beauty berries. We, ironically, we don't have the native, the, the straight species, the purple one, but we do, we will have the white flowered and the pink white. Well, it is white flowered, the white fruited and the pink fruited forms this year. Um, now, a good thing it, with those two, it's better to put them in a little bit of dappled shade. They won't bleach. Um, but that the pink one, when that came out, it was a, I mean, we didn't have a great pink one. It was found in a population down in Texas, but it, it, it is it, in full sun, it'll tend to bleach a bit. So it's great to put it in a little bit of part shade, but it will get, you know, Cali Carpa will get yellow fall color. It's a great cutback shrub. So if it starts getting too big or you want to get a bit thicker at the right before spring, go ahead and cut it down to about six to 10 inches. And it'll, when it re-sprouts, it'll fill in even more. So, you know, if you cut back one stem, you can expect about four stems coming out of that. So it's a great way, you know, if it gets too big, just hack it back. Um, we wanted to do a cutback shrub border at one point of all shrubs you can do that with. Uh, button bush, this is a plant that can grow in standing water. Again, it's another pollinator magnet. Um, people, there's a selection called Sputnik, which, you know, those flowers do kind of remind you of a little, sat, you know, the little satellite, um, but it gets these little globes, pollinators go crazy on it. It can go in, in standing water to regular average soils. Um, you know, when it's not in flower, it's a little bit nondescript, but, um, you know, if you're looking to attract pollinators in the garden, this is a good one for it. Um, this, if you're looking for winter color in your garden, um, I don't know why, I originally had to go to New Jersey to get this plant. This is the best performing color twig dogwood in our area, hands down. Um, you know, when you see, go up north and you see these wonderful stands of red twig dogwood and you come down here and they're like, y'all, it's too hot and humid for me. This one has done fantastic. We had one that we never cut back in our old yard. It was eight feet tall. It looked like you had plugged it into an outlet. Um, it's just phenomenal color. It, you know, you can hack it back. Midwinter fire will tend to sucker out, which, you know, is good if you want a bigger clump or if you want to dig up pieces and move it around the garden. But hands down, the best color twig garden in the garden. Uh, yes. I have never, I, I have never encountered a problem with this. Yeah. Um, and, you know, unfortunately it's like, we've got some plants and we're just butchering them for cuttings. I want to get some out in the, you know, it's kind of like, we, we need to reserve some that we don't touch so we can get them big. But I, I just, I wouldn't garden without this specific plant. Um, you know, and if you can look in your garden of where either when during sunrise or sunset, where the light's coming in during winter, cite it there because it's just phenomenal to bring some winter color. And, you know, it is like any of the shrub dogwoods, white flowers in spring. It does get good yellow fall color, but the stems are what you grow this for. Um, sweet pepper bush. This is a fantastic for fragrance, for pollinators, for good fall color. Um, this just happens to be a pink, um, you know, ruby is kind of a stretch for describing the color. It's more of a darker pink, um, but this was one of the selections of our native. It will sucker. It can tolerate anything from wet soils to average garden soils, but it's a great thing for, you know, if you've got a, um, I've told people if they have a slope in their yard, this is a great plant to start putting in, to start suckering and filling in a slope. Um, we have a friend that he has a, um, a screen in porch and the foundation planning is plethora. So he said like this time of year, it's just heavenly to sit out there with the fragrance. I don't, so with walnut trees, I remember, you know, working at Tony Abbott's, you know, he kind of, he will say that's an old wives tale because we have, you know, when you go to Tony's, there's hundreds of different species growing under walnut trees. And I can attest to that because I remember weeding under them when the nuts started dropping. Um, I don't know how any of us escape without a concussion, but I think some of it is like, if you, you know, they do release tannins into the soil. So what I would recommend is, you know, fall season, rake that stuff up and dump it somewhere else. But I don't think you would have a problem with it. 
our oak leaf hydrangea, what we're selling, we've just, you know, sown seed of this. So it, you know, it could be all across the board in terms of, you know, there are varieties that are selected to be dwarf. There are some really big varieties. I think these are going to be middle of the road, probably getting about five to maybe seven feet tall. Um, you know, with oak leaf hydrangea, you can get some great fall color with it. Um, it's just, you know, you get exfoliating bark on the stems on some of the older plants. It's just, it's a great hydrangea for the garden. Um, and like I said, the fall color can be, I've seen oranges per, to purple. Um, it's, it's, it's definitely some, you know, I think my parents, when they knew they were moving down here in 75, my dad rooted a cutting and brought it down with them. And I think, I think it's still in the garden, but you know, it's a durable plant. Um, now this one is not native, but this, I love hydrangea serrata. Everyone, you know, when you think about mop head hydrangeas, that's hydrangea macropola. That's the one that tends to, we have a late freeze, late freeze in the spring, kiss your flowers goodbye. As a general rule, mountain hydrangea doesn't have that issue. It's a bit more cold hardy. One thing that's kind of nice is it's, you know, your regular mop heads like endless summer or anything like this, this is gonna be smaller in stature. It's only gonna get, you know, the biggest ones I've seen that were really old specimens were maybe four feet tall, but, you know, picture about three feet tall, three feet wide. Um, the flowers, you know, because these are seedlings, they're probably gonna be more of the lace cap type. Um, these photos are actually at my dad's yard. He's got some that where there's a wet area. So the seed was dropping and actually germinating really well. So we just started moving seedlings around. So he's got this whole hillside covered with everything from this dark blue to light pink to light blue. It's, I think it's a fantastic hydrangea that there's some Japanese selections that we want to start selling, you know, in our spring sales that I love it because it's not as in your face as the mop heads. Um, it's a little bit more, you know, delicate where you can appreciate the detail on it. But again, this one, typical, you know, you have a late freeze. This one has a higher chance of actually flowering again that season. Um, Itea, this is a great multi-season shrub. Again, this is a, a good suckering shrub if you want to cover a big area, if you have a slope. Um, great, you know, white flowers in uh, midsummer or spring to early summer. Fragrant, great fall color. Um, the stems even have a reddish cast to them. Um, but again, this one can go from wet soils to average garden soils, but it is a suckering shrub. So, you know, I've seen it used in landscapes where you really shouldn't have put a, put a suckering shrub and it becomes a maintenance nightmare. So just bear that in mind where you cite it. Of if It's going to want to keep expanding its area. But, you know, in terms of fall color, it's great. You know, it's a great pollinator plant. They go nuts over it when it flowers. Um, and again, these are seedlings. So, you know, again, size can vary. Um, there are some great selections out there, but this is just straight species. Um, coastal dog hobble. Um, these, they, it's a great evergreen for shady areas. Um, it, 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 it doesn't present well sometimes in the nursery because overhead irrigation tends to put a, a kind of a spotting on it so it doesn't look good. So, but once you get it in the landscape and it's not generally getting overhead irrigation, it's pretty clean. Um, it's a member of the, of the blueberry family. So it gets those kind of blueberry-like flowers in the spring. Um, what's nice is it's green during the summer, but then as you go into winter, it'll get a purplish cast to the leaves. But it's a, it's a nice evergreen for shade, for light shade. Don't put it in really dense shade. Um, and it will suffer a bit. Uh, this is one that was shared to us by a, uh, a friend of the gardens. Uh, oh my God, I, Nancy, I'm forgetting your name. and I'm so sorry, I'm blacking out. Nancy Harper Janeway. Um, this was shared to her by, I think, J.C. Ralston. This is, you know, our mock orange, but add, a, add gold leaves to it and heavy, heavy fragrance. Um, it just, you know, some mock oranges, the fragrance kind of hit or miss. This one is a heavily fragrant one. And then you also have this benefit of these bright gold leaves in the spring. So it's, it's a fantastic. I mean, I was quick to go ahead and put one in our yard. 
Um, and it's great. You know, she brought us, I think, a vase of uh, stems of this to bring into the garden, and it was fantastic. Perfume the whole office. Um, our native nine bar, these have been really popular with the purple leaf ones. Um, I've noticed that the purple leaf ones have some disease issues. I've never noticed it on the straight species of getting the powdery mildew that shows up on them. Um, it's great. It's in the spirea family. It kind of has flowers that remind you of spirea. Um, again, great for pollinators. Um, the bark on the stems will peel, so you get that nice aspect. Um, it's a great multi-season shrub for the garden. Um, I'm going to kind of breeze through these. My mission before I die is people are going to embrace deciduous azaleas more. Um, our native species, what's great is if you have a lot of diversity in your garden of different species, you can expand your blooming of deciduous azaleas from early spring to there are some species that are just wrapping up right now. Um, there's some of species which are heavily fragrant. Um, Albaments, this first one has a really, really strong fragrance to it. Um, it's a fantastic plant. So, you know, like this one's mid to mid April. Then you go, this is made or this is May into July, another fragrant one. Um, some of them tend to be more suffering than others. Some of them tolerate wetter soils, but there's such great diversity in all the different species we carry. So we've got a whole slew of different species coming in. Um, Atlanticum, this is another one. This is a bit smaller size and stature, doesn't get as big as some of the other ones. Um, I've seen selections that have almost a bluish cast to the leaves. Um, I just can't go on enough about deciduous azaleas. I love them. I love the straight species. I love the hybrids. Um, Austrinum, these are where you get the yellows and some of the reds and oranges. Um, you know, I have a friend that's on a mission to find the best red deciduous azalea. All the reds tend to be orange red, not a true, you know, true red, but Austrinum's a great one for spraying good fragrance. Canescens, another one, great for almost a honeysuckle-like fragrance. Um, we're getting ready to redo all the deciduous azaleas that are in the lower formal garden. Um, a lot of them were Ghent hybrids um, or Exbury azaleas, which were selected in, in England, never saw a day above 80 degrees, so they're not necessarily happy in the south. Um, some of them that we have in the garden right now are from the Northern Light series. They're not as happy in the south. So basically, I reached out to the person we're getting our deciduous azaleas from, and I said, these are the colors I need tell me the best ones we can put in the garden. So one of the ones is this selection. Well, it's coming up. Pomania is another one. Escosum, this is another good one. I'll show you one of the ones It's coming up. I know it's in here. Um, but this is one good fall color on this species. Pernifolium is one of the later flowering ones, one of the last of the flowering. I've seen hybrids between pernifolium and arborescens. There's one called Sweet September, and it was selected because it blooms in September. But now Prunifolium does not have fragrance to it. But if you go down to Callaway Gardens, this is the one that's noted for blooming down there in the late fall. Um, so My Mary, this is one, a lot of your deciduous azaleas, they flower best when they're more in sun. You move them into dense shade and you won't get as good flowering. Now, um, Transplant Nursery, which has long been a staple of deciduous azaleas, they started selecting for deciduous azaleas that bloom better in shade. And this one, there was a whole series called Made in the Shade. My Mary is one of the better ones for flowering in shade. Um, again, it'll do fine in sun, but good fragrance. Um, but you can push it into more shady locations. So this is the one that I kept waiting on. This is one that, um, the gentleman who has the nursery that we get our deciduous azaleas from, he made this selection called Chocolate Drop. And the leaves emerge in spring, the same color as some of your Japanese maples. So, and you know, as summer progresses, it'll start fading and going more towards green. But I mean, that color, I, when he first showed me this, I was like, okay, definitely throw an extra one on the truck for me. Um, so this will be going in the garden, but we also, all the ones that we could, um, that are going in the garden, we made sure they're included in the plant sale. Um, possum hall viburnum, 
we have the straight species, and then we have a variety called uh, bulk or winterthur. Um, now this one, it's not a sales gimmick. It's better to have, two, it's kind of like uh, blueberries where it's better to have two different clones for better pollination to get the fruit in the fall. Um, spring, you get these wonderful white flowers, really clean foliage throughout the growing season. If you've got, if, if you've got you know, good pollination, it'll start developing fruit. And that fruit will go from green to pink to blue as it ages. And even the blue fruit will persist into winter. Um, but it's better to have multiple clones in the garden. I, I swear this is not a gimmick to get you to buy two plants, but if it works, we'll go with that. Yes. Yeah. So you could either get, you know, the straight species, those are probably all different clones, or you could get Winterthur and the straight species, you know, just get, either two of the straight, you know, you follow me. You wanna have two different ones. But they're, they're, I love this viburnum. It's a great native viburnum. Um, now this is another one, um, goes by the name of Arrowwood. And it was selected because from the, from the ground, it would send these great straight shoots up that the Indians actually used for Arrowwood. Um, this one, Golden Arrow, is actually one I found years ago working at the Ralston Arboretum. We were driving, we did a, a whole statewide evaluation network, and we were down on the eastern part of the state. And my co conspirator on this whole you know, installation knew when my head whipped around, we needed to turn around. This is where they have the pine tree plantations, and you'd see those ditches. Something gold grabbed my eye. I had to jump across a ditch and yank a sucker off one of these plants. <coughs> that ended up being this one we named Golden Arrow. It's a gold form of our native viburnum. So it's got bright gold leaves. Um, it's better in a bit of shade. If you put it out in full sun, it'll tend to bleach, which you know, Durr was so kind to point out in his book. Um, like, oh, thank you. you know, it's just sighted a little bit better, huh? Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's one of our native selections, you know, it has a connection to me because it's one of my babies that you know we we rescued from a ditch, um, but it's a native with a little bit of flair to it. Um, kind of starting to wrap things up. I'm, I'm, I can be a little long-winded on these things, but trees. Um, we've got some of our buckeyes. This is our red buckeye, which is you know it's our only red-flowered native tree. Um, and it's great because it comes into flower as the hummingbirds are making their way back up. So it's a favorite of hummingbirds. Um, it is a sort of, sort of a small stature tree. So it only get, you know, I would, I always describe it as dogwood size. So, you know, you're looking at about 20 feet in height. Um, the one thing that, you know, if you notice like the planting out by the meadow or if you notice other ones, they drop their leaves early. For some reason, some of them get like a bacterial scorch that just makes them drop their leaves. Alan Weekly was just surmising on, on Facebook this, this morning. He had a post about this saying, oh, you know, Buckeyes in their face and their great fall color, which is nothing because they drop their leaves early. Um, there's actually a species in California that when summer hits, it drops everything, goes dormant for the summer. And it's a, an adaptation because it's dry as a bone out there. So, you know, let's not have leaves and lose water. But so this is our, you know, our red buckeye. Um, we've also, this is one that in the spring, if you're driving around and you look in the woods, you'll see this in the woods flowering. It's kind of got a kind of a greenish yellow flower. Um, and the name Sylvatica in Latin actually means of the woods. So it'll be, it's a great understory tree, um, flowers early. It will, like the pavia, it'll drop its leaves early, but I, I love this species for being in the woodland because you can spot it. It's kind of like a sign, yes, spring's here. Um, now, sometimes it does leave out too early. It could get hit by a late frost, but it'll bounce back through that. But um, just to offer a different buckeye, um, I do love this one though. Francie Graybeard, I, I've been scared to death with, um, this is in the same family as Ash. And there have been reports that the, you know, Asian law, the, Emerald green ash borer also will kill Francie Graybrick beard. Now, I haven't heard a lot of reports about that, and I'm willing to take the chance because 
This is a phenomenal native. Um, there's some great selections out there. There's one called uh, Spring Fleecing. Um, a nurseryman na named it because it always flowered on tax day. So he named it Spring, spring Fleecing. Um, but fantastic fall, you know, fall color on these, great spring uh, and great fragrance on it. Um, this is a plant that it's a great pollinator. Um, it would fall kind of into that large shrub, small tree. Um, I have a fond memory. There's, if you go down on the eastern part of the state towards the green swamp, there's a place called Bladen Lake. And it's Carolina Bays. And out in that park, the trees in the park are Cyrilla. And they can get some great fall color. They get this wonderful exfoliating bark. They get these great spring flowers. And you will never see this in the box stores. Um, you know, it's a little bit gangly in its use. And you, can, you might have to train it to become more of a tree. But I, it is fantastic. It can tolerate wet soils. Um, I just, you know, this is one that I, one of my personal missions to make it more popular. But um, let's see. Um, this is a plant that you will be taking a gamble on this, but it's a great tree. Pick me a brachiata. I, you know, I have certain plants that I really want to see in the wild, and this is one of them. Um, it's in the same family as gardenia, as coffee. Um, what's it, the flowers are like lime green they're tiny it's these pink bracts that are underneath the flowers that give you this wonderful display um, if you walk out or if you've been in the garden you've seen these uh, these weird shrubs that I've had during the summer the muciandas it's in the same family but great fall great foliage to it um, it's got a relative called Emenopterus that was always the holy grail to be able to flower it in the U.S. The first one took 75 years from seed to flower. These tend to flower a lot earlier. Um, it, don't put it in wet soils. It needs moist soils. Um, don't put it in dry soils. But um, I just think it's a fantastic tree. We got a handful. We're going to plant some out when we do our landscape along Coliseum. But I wanted to make a, a handful of these available in the sale. Um, there is a variety called Precocious that flowers earlier in age, um, but I, I think it's just a really cool plant. Uh, and y'all know me by now, I like cool plants. Um, this is one of our native big leaf magnolias, um, huge flowers on it. Um, this species is actually a bit smaller in stature than, you know, you have to make whether, whether it's a straight species or a subspecies, but huge leaves. The undersides of the leaves are brilliant silver, flowers about the size of a basketball. Um, it's just fantastic. It does get kind of yellowish to tan fall color, but it kind of gives you a tropical feel in the garden, but it's a native. Um, but awesome flowers. Um, you know, definitely want to add, we've got some of these that are, that are set aside to go out on the property, but this is a really fantastic, you know, one, there's a handful of big leaf magnolias that, you know, I, I think this is a showstopper. We do have some long leaf pine. These are kind of fun to play with those container plants because they look like cousin it in their juvenile stage, um, but then plant them out into the garden and then they'll start shooting up. But, you know, this was a key species in North Carolina. Um, you know, and they will get big. They'll get, you know, that one of those huge cones that are kind of fun to play with. Uh, we do have, you know, our native sycamore. We also have the London plane tree. These were all cuttings from the ones right out front. Um, now, bear in mind, these are big trees. Um, you know, they do like it, you know, moist soils. They'll be happier there. Uh, but, you know, any sycamore, they're not, they're not small. So, you know, keep that in mind if you're getting these for the yard. And that's it. So let me see if I can stop sharing the screen, see how many questions. I see 13. Um, so let's see. And for those of you in person that, you know, have sweated about a gallon with me, y'all are troopers. Um, let's see. So, you're welcome. And hopefully, you know, keep an eye out. That email should go out at two. If you didn't get it, reach out to us. 
um, at gardens at wfu.edu and we'll make sure you get the email or make sure you become a friend. Um, so the native plant nursery, someone asked about that. We get it from Lazy K Nursery. He's wholesale though. Um, I did say that the spider flower, the Lycoris will bloom in shady areas. Um, someone commented that it, something is a good skeeter repellent. We I think we've got a couple. Uh, we won't have, someone was asking about marsh pink, which is the, you know, we've got the one Sebacea kennediana, the, the pink gentian that I mentioned. Um, Angularis is an annual, but I am trying to find seed because I want it myself. Um, uh, someone said, okay, fireworks goldenrod was the one. Uh, London Grove blue phlox. Um, I will try to have those in the spring sale. We did have that, I think, this past spring, but uh, someone asked about native azaleas, how to keep the deer from eating them to stem. Um, if you're a deer lover, close your ears, hot lead. Um, the other option is spray them with uh, one of the repellents like we use in the vegetable garden, like liquid fence, I must gardens, uh, deer repellent. Just get them used to, hey, this doesn't taste good. Um, yes, we will not have the purple fruiting beauty berry. I tried and everyone was sold out and we forgot to propagate it. Um, do we ever have spice bush? We don't this year, but I can try to make it a, an effort to get some next year. I think that's all of our questions. If anyone else has a question after this, feel free to email me. Um, just email at gardens at wfu.edu. Um, and we thank everyone for their attention. And we will be seeing you either online for the next talk or at the plant sale. So with Without further ado, I'm going to wrap this up. Thank y'all.